Hey you guys, jumping into another little ditty on the 1965 Fury Wagon where we finish addressing the cooling system. And then we're gonna be upgrading from the original Holley Sniper to the Sniper 2 that recently came out. Has a lot of upgrades and I read really good things. Uh, Scott from Holley actually saw the last video. He saw I was having a few issues with it. Of course, we re rectified the, the harness connectors inside of there and didn't have any after, but uh, apparently they have some other known problems that have all been addressed with the Sniper 2. So more on that later in the video. Uh, so uh, right now the thermostat's still out, and the reason for that is because as I drive it, I want it to just stir up as much crud from the engine and runner through where we had the screen before. Kind of ditch that because, well, the vinyl I used was... Uh, <laughs> Not rated for high temperature, high pressure. Never did blow out though. But this morning I just went ahead and stuffed the sock in there temporarily. I wanna see how that does capturing anything. Went and drove 75 miles round trip to pick up these card cabinets. Nice, nice quality. 50 bucks for everything. Not too bad, but check out this gate. Uh, I mean, I've never seen such a good design. Once lubing up these uh, these rods, a torsion bar system, I suppose it is. It's uh, it's amazing. Wait, it's one finger. I mean, this thing is so ahead of its time. I just can't even get over it. But beneath this cover, I have to get it off because these latches were completely rusted solid in the uh, sleeves in there. But there was a uh, huge mouse nest under here, just completely. Oh. Point three gallons and we did a total GPS 79 miles so 9.5 miles to the gallon and that was going easy where we went it was doing like 45 mile an hour country roads so that's uh, it's pretty bad it's the best we're gonna get it's nine and a half miles to the gallon oh oh no look at that I rolled this window up as I was driving and I guess the tailgate was a crack open it didn't pick the track and it skipped, skipped the track. I'm so lucky that didn't break going down the road. You got lucky there. A few drives later, let's see what this sock is looking like. And if it was uh, holding up or blowing through. It didn't blow through. Let's take a look inside. Oh yeah, this is great. Oh man. I think that's my one magnet, right? Yeah. But look at that. The sock is working awesome. So, you know, a lot of people comment on the last video about how I need to run a like CLR through here, or Cascade or one of the other many, many things. But I'm like, no, we need to just get rid of this stuff first and then we can worry about flushing it. This is just, and uh, some people were saying it's casting sand, but no, it's, it's rust. And as you know, I drive this harder, I mean, I know the water continues causing corrosion, but look, there's there's huge chunks of stuff. Oh, this block has got to be getting thin inside. <laughs> Let's just keep going to town with it. The sock trick works amazing. For the sock, you just stuff her on in here. And you know, a stocking or something could work too, but the white sock seems to do pretty good. But in addition to that, I got these little magnets, these egg magnets. And I was going to get like a magnetic ball to just roll across. Originally, I was thinking multiple balls, but then realized they would stick to each other. So I think I'll just leave this whole rack in here and then we can pull it out at a later time. And that way, uh, you know, this might shift across the radiator, or what have you. And that way it'll pick up anything else. We'll see what's actually making it past the sock, because right now it's, yeah, 
There you go. Let that roll around up there. <laughs> and by the way, each time I'm draining this, I am pulling the plugs out of the block too and flushing that out with a hose each time. It's uh, just going ham, you know? You would think this sock would restrict it too much and blow out, but as you saw, it didn't. Of course, it still leaks a little bit, but it's a little trickle ain't hurt nothing. Now look what just came in the mail. The coolant system filter is like $80 for these, which I think is way overpriced. And it's basically a larger version of those fuel filters that everybody hates, the, the glass thread on filters. And they, what do they say? Uh, they start more fires than ex-wives or something there about. But I'll show you what it looks like on the inside. It's got this heavy duty glass. It seems to be glass anyway. Yeah, definitely not plastic. And then these aluminum threads, so that's kind of what I don't like about this. I, I would like to see this all stainless because I don't, you know, the aluminum's gonna corrode and seize into this and it's just, these are aluminum ends too. So I'll rock it for now, we'll see what it does. This was the most popular choice that you guys recommended. I mean, there was, everybody's like pour vinegar, metal rescue, evapo rust, all sorts of different things. But the CLR is pretty cheap. I'll go with a gallon of it. And I know that's not exactly gonna be 50-50, but hey, I think that'll do it. We'll run there, run it like that for a few days, put the inline filter, probably put a new sock in to run that, see if it catches anything that the inline filter doesn't. I ditched the flex hose and that'll do it. We got the sock restrictor right there. And now fill it up with a gallon of CLR. It's nice being able to see it crystal clear. Wow, that is flowing a lot. Definitely aerating the whole system. Been sitting here island for over 20 minutes and you see it kind of settled down in there as far as the bubbles go. The rad is, doesn't even feel warm at all. Uh, so with no thermostat, you see it's just not warming up. Of course, it's only 50 degrees out today, and we're at 130 degrees on the coolant temp. We're about 12 hours later, decided to drain out the CLR because I noticed like where it's spilling out. I mean, it's it's getting all solidified and you know, it's kind of kind of nasty stuff. So that's what the, the filter looks like. I don't know how well you can see in there. But I'll get that all cleaned out, drain the block, flush it a few times, get antifreeze in it, and I suppose we'll leave the screen on for a while. The sock didn't have too much crud, but uh, yeah, I didn't want to let it go for several days in case it, you know, corrodes the aluminum really bad or something. Right, with hot water on the garden hose, I did three full rinses on this and then uh, left the block plugs out and was running it a bunch, so we got all that CLR out. Gonna be putting the thermostat back in. Here's a look inside of the system now. You know, when we originally worked on this car, it was so rusty and crusty in there. Well, it's looking better. Uh, now, 180 thermostat going in. I guess we still didn't get to answer the question of uh, does it run cooler without the thermostat? The answer is yes. On every street car, if you run without the thermostat, it's pretty much never gonna get up to operating temperature, but it's it's completely case by case. Like if you're doing circle track racing and you're red line the, the whole time and you have no thermostat, yeah, maybe that extra flow uh, could cause some issues and cause cavitation in the block and the, the block to get hotter. But in this case, I, I took this down the highway today, it didn't get above 140 on the highway and come to a stoplight, let it idle or shut it off, let uh, you know the temperature equalize, didn't go above that. So the system's clean, it's operating great. Winter's here, we gotta get her up to temperature. So all right, stuff that, and then get uh, get her full of antifreeze, corrosion protection. And with that thermostat in now, you can see with it cold, there is no flow, even if I rev it. No flow coming through, just a little gurgle from the jiggle valve, but uh, that coolant is circulating the bot in the block. Until it gets up to time to slap that Holly Sniper 2 on there. Before it gets dark, I wanted to show you guys what I came up with for a carport door. 
I'll walk over there in a second, but I had to cut a little bit of metal and check out these cuts. I was using a metal circular saw that I just purchased and best investment ever. I mean, look at that, look at the angles and there's no burst. Like you guys know if you use the, the regular uh, abrasive wheels, you end up with all this metal hanging off and they're real sloppy. This, this is just incredible. Look, look at that paper, paper thin. I should have, you know, there's no sparks when you're cutting it either, but it does shoot razor sharp metal everywhere. So uh, it's a good idea to use a special saw that has proper cover and lower RPM meant for these steel carbide blades. And man, if you haven't used one yet, if you're still using the, the old uh, cutting wheels, well, actually, so like, like these kind, this is a nice upgrade too, the diamond abrasive ones. But this, definitely a pricey bugger, but it's the M18 Milwaukee metal cutting circular saw, eight inch. Can't believe I got by so many years without that. That thing is a game changer. And here's a quick glance at the roll up tarp door for the carport, keep the rain, snow and leaves out. I do plan to do like little curtains on the side. These are each five foot sections, but I kind of just wanted to keep majority of everything out of there. So I'll, I'll leave it open for now, see how it is. You guys have probably seen this design before on, on Google or YouTube, essentially yeah, fixed hooks on the front. And then on the bottom, a piece of two inch PVC with it screwed through the eyelets to the, to the tarp, comes back up to a pulley mounted on each one. And then I'm gonna get a triple pulley mounted over here. Got one of those on order. But now all you gotta do to roll it up is unclean it. And then uh, once this is on the triple pulley, you'll be able to pull one string. But for now, just kind of keep these all together. And Look at that, that is a very heavy tarp tube. And once I get that triple pulley mounted over here, these will be tucked up out of the way, much neater. I just wanted to show you guys that since in a previous video when I mentioned I wanted to put a cover over this, you guys commented a lot of really good ideas. I also like that the tarp is not dragging on the ground and with the PVC pipe, you have a little bit of weight down there, so it should hold up. We'll see how it does in the wind. I think it's important for it to be able to breathe too with the sides open. And now let's take a look at this Holly Sniper 2 EFI ecosystem. Comes with a quick start manual, full color. And this is actually the upgrade kit. So if you already have an existing classic sniper, then you don't have to get a new O2 sensor, a fuel pump, coolant temp sensor, main harness, all of that is reused with this one. A uh, few notable upgrades that I was reading about is it uses a magnetic TPS, throttle position sensor. It has redesigned injector connectors, which I suppose will pop one of these covers off, take a look at them. The harness is hidden inside. So instead of coming out on both sides and tucking underneath, it just comes out of the back. The crossover tube is cast in. You see for the fuel crossover on the old one, there was a rubber hose. Oh, just one more thing to fail and potentially leak. By the way, I had mentioned before I had oil residue in the back of this lifter valley and kind of getting all over everything. Finally found the leak. I just looked down and sure enough, there's a uh, hairline crack, I guess like a stress crack in this cover down here. So I'll get a new one of those, but just silicone it up for now because I'm thinking I want to get a dual plane intake for this too. And while they appear similar, a side-by-side -side reveals that the Sniper 2 is fully redesigned. And look at all the wiring I have to do. It is plug and play with this harness. Uh, they, you do need to use a new handheld as well because the M8 connector, uh, the old one doesn't have that style. And this gets plugged directly into this harness. I was reading the instructions, make sure not to plug it into the, uh, the adapter harness. They say it takes one hour or less if you're upgrading from the classic sniper system and I can see why now. I'm gonna get going on that. Now, by the way, these are all made in Bowling Green, Kentucky, manufactured and tested there. Oh wait, let's look at these connectors in here. A 964th Allen, to get the, the hex off. You can see the injectors. There we go. Okay, so similar design to the last one, but let's check out these uh, connectors. All right, better action there, feel tight. Yes. That is fully redesigned. Do you remember what the last ones looked like? They were a joke. These ones have nice quality O-rings on them. 
and they, uh, the terminal pins are actually supported. So that's uh, not going to have any issues here. Listen, that snaps right in. Do have one, uh, I don't know what this, this gray is for. I'll have to look in the instructions, but that's for something else that I don't need right now. Good stuff. The o rings are oiled up, and this crossover tube, I'm gonna put a little dab of grease around that o ring. You know, the reason this would start leaking in the future would be if any salt or moisture gets in here and causes corrosion on the aluminum. I could see that leaking, leaking gas. But, uh, you know, that's if you're in the rust region, driving around in the salt anyway. We just throw some grease all around that, have no problem in the future. I like it. One last thing to check before I pull the old sniper off is boot time and startup time. Oh, here's how long it takes with the key on. All right, pumps off, booted, here goes cranking. All right, pretty quick. But when it's cold outside and it hasn't ran for a few days, it usually cranks a lot longer. So I just wanted that as like a, a base test. Now all we gotta do is get all these wires, connectors off, take the fuel hoses, hope they don't spray in our face. A little bit of pressure in there. As always, a good idea to disconnect the battery. Disconnect all your vacuum hoses, and then get a little pop up off of here. There we go. Off with the old. Ooh, spilling gas. And about an hour later, we are ready to start this up. As per usual, I left the wiring just a complete rat's nest before verifying that uh, it's gonna run. Then I'll go back and do that. Did throw me off with the fuel uh, inlet and outlet being on this side. I'm sorry, inlet, outlet. Because they were on the back on the other one. Now I went over in the fuel hose bin and luckily I had one long enough for the feed side. Mounted the fuel pressure regulator up here. And yeah, we'll tidy that all up. Uh, time to run the wizard and fire it up. We got somebody hiding back there. She came in to hang out. I was like, can you, uh, can you just leave? Jeez. <laughs> just kidding. Let, let a person know when they're not welcome. I know you can't see it too well on this camera, but you just go in the sniper wizard and input your parameters. These are to use a stylus on this. Eight cylinder, 383 cubic inches. Called a race cam because it's got that big old purple cam. And by the way, uh, Holly has a great video showing you tips on installing this since I know I didn't really cover that. So let's just finish this and we'll fire it up. It uploads that in, should hit the fuel pump. Please cycle ignition to complete the operation. Done deal. Now, load up time is the same on this, and let's go ahead and do a crank, see what happens. Okay. Yeah. Well, it wants to go. It's gonna have some learning to do, because it is just dumping fuel. Yeah, at least all four injectors are working this time. I had to wrap it up last night. Let's take a ride today, see how it drives, and what it does for a little self-tuning, because these kind of you know, figure themselves out, which is nice. Looks like Jennifer is coming. She's probably not gonna be able to open that door though. She's, oh, you got it. These doors are very hard to open in the uh, winter time. Oh, let me get that pin. Uh, this may or may not, you know, break down there. Where are we going? Just for a test and tune, I guess. So, an auto tune, right? It's mosquito in here. Really? Oh, there's a bee. Too. Ah, give me a Okay, come on, buddy. It's just a honeybee. It's a warm day out. All right, he's going, babe. Oh, he's oh there's another one. I'm not they like the color. No, you're fine. They're just honeybees, babe. 
Babe, babe, they're just honeybees. She's <laughs> allergic to bees. Allergic they're, to everything. they're all gone. There was only two of them. There's no nest in here. They were just coming from the hive in the back. We got we got bees out back, honeybees. They're friendly. It's coming out because it's sunny. And it's, it's like 50 degrees today. All right. Good to go. Okay. Go. We're here. It's got some learning to do. <laughs> well, we're up to 184. It was sitting here idling forever. Let's see what the air fuel ratio does when I put it in the gear. It seems to be. Look at that. I guess we could try turning the idle up some. Yeah, we'll do that. Just for now. You just go over to tuning, basic, basic idle. I'm gonna just turn this up to like, you know, 850. Let's do. Now we put it in gear. No, doll. It's trying to figure itself out. That's what it's doing. Sniper seems to be doing its thing. No hiccups, hesitations, bucking. Just running great. And drop you off for a little shopping. Woo! You got 10 minutes. 10 minutes. To get some food. Get around the ham. Get the ham, yeah, the free ham. While she's in there shopping, I wanna check the vacuum on the engine because when we set this up, I chose race cam, which is for seven inches or less manifold vacuum. Street and strip would be eight to 13 inches. And then you got uh, stock mild cam. However, this gauge is stuck at two inches, well, while well, starting at. Well, we'll just have to compensate for that. Yeah, the right stuff has kind of sealed that leak. A little bit of oil residue on top. I'll get a new cover on order, or we could just weld that one, but I bet you it's so paper thin, and it's, how much could one of those be? Dirt cheap, I'm sure. So we got manifold vacuum off the back, runs over to our little vacuum tank. And wow, 10 inches, so more like eight inches. That is fairly low. No smoke out of the tailpipe, that is a healthy engine. Did you get the rum him? Oh yeah, sweet. The best grocery getter ever. Jen made us stop at CVS too. I have a coupon. She's got a four dollar coupon that she wants to spend. I'm like, this thing probably burned four dollars of gas <laughs> getting there. I'm the coupon queen. Oh. That doors. Don't break your thumb. <laughs> I got you. How much was the junkie? Uh, five dollars so they got a dollar out of me oh, all right that's not too bad let's just do one more startup on this uh, i'll let it fully boot this time see if that makes any difference since that's what we did on the sniper one can we talk about the cbs receipts does anybody want to talk about what's going on here yeah around the same no no gas pedal no nothing So far on the Sniper 2, gonna give it a giant thumbs up. It's nice to see they made some improvements and it's operating very well. I can button the rest of that wire up confidently. Next thing on the list is ditching the Flexifan. Uh, reading the comments and you guys said these can get very brittle and just kind of blow apart over time. You know, it does seem to work fine and it's reliable since there's no clutch on it, but I did get this OEM Mopar from the junkyard. Uh, it's got the fan clutch on there. Pretty heavy duty aluminum uh, fan. Well, steel and aluminum. Well, I guess I'll put that on, see how it operates. All right. Is it playtime? <laughs> Guys, get the ball. 
Yeah, man, these are just razor sharp. If you slip and hit your knuckle on one of them, whew, not good. I'm sure some of you guys have done that before. And uh, this one actually has a pretty big chip and a crack right here too on the spacer. Yeah. Oof. Imagine, like when I was taking these bolts off here, imagine you slipped. That would slice right through your tendons too. By golly. What game is this? lazy one where I'm playing catch with myself. What game is that? Is she not letting you run? Is she not letting you run, boy? The goose man. So strong. Drop that. Drop it. Well, I want to play. No. Hey, drop that. Here is a side-by-side -side comparison of them. You can see the OEM a little bit more in diameter, but much heavier duty and strong. Got some OEM bolts too, check that out. I'll keep this for something. Well, who knows, maybe this clutch is shot. You can always easily replace that though, just four, four nuts. Just enough clearance between the trans lines. Eh, a little bit of play in that. Oh well, that should be good, right? You guys know I have pretty bad luck with radiators and fans in past videos. Oh, that flows lots of air at idle. Belt squeal, I gotta tighten it up. Look at that throttle response. Oh, that's actually way nicer than the flex fan. This was noisy and just a power drag. That little click you guys just heard, I don't, I don't know if you heard that. That's this plate as the engine gets you know, pressure difference inside the block, that plate's going up and down. That's probably what caused it to the fatigue and crack like that. Love it. Nice upgrade. Just gotta get a rad fan shroud for it. And then be good. Well, we can blow this down the highway later and see how it does with the cooling. I think I'm gonna take Jen out for a night on the town, you know, Friday evening, go hit up Parks Casino. Which, by the way, if you guys ever see us out and about, feel free to you know, stop and say hi, because I saw a guy had commented about seeing us in a Torino, but he wasn't sure if it was us or didn't want to bother us. Yeah, hey, if you see this car and you see us, feel free to stop over. Uh, but you know what else I want to do is switch this coolant again, because I smell, I still smell a little bit of CLR, which I really flushed out a whole bunch with the garden hose after having that in there. But I can smell a hint. This doesn't have the recovery bottle, so it's been dripping a touch as it adjusts its level. Clearly, I, I put it up a little too high. When you don't have a recovery bottle, you want to leave an inch or so at the top for expansion. Otherwise, it's going to drip. But yeah, like look how kind of cloudy it is. So we'll blow this down the highway, lay some miles on it, and see what that looks like. The next thing I wanted to do is update you guys on Gen Civic. If you guys saw it over on the second channel, NNK H2, we did a video fixing the transmission, drop a link to it up here. And it's been over a week now, over 100 miles, just running perfect. No slipping, smooth shifts, oh no back flushing, transmission on these, uh, definitely the way to go. Or you know, keep up on the fluid changes. But I wanted to address a few of the, the comments I saw. You guys were tearing me up over these headlights saying, how could you let Jen drive around with hazy headlights? And you know, with, with this car, I kind of just put my blinders on. Like, I got already a pretty elaborate hoopty fleet of, of junk to maintain. So with this one, unless she's saying, hey, it's doing something, I don't really pay attention. I drive it sometimes too. I mean, they work fine, but uh, less than two years ago, her father got her a, a certificate for an auto body shop to do a professional job restoring and 
coating these with, with like a UV resistant coating uh, for Christmas. She went and did that. It's been less than two years because she didn't do it like right after Christmas. And look, they're already shot. And I had the same experience on my Tundra. So I did the right thing, went on Amazon, spent 80 bucks on a set of new lights. They've been great. I told her to do the same. She plans to do a video on that. The next item I saw a bunch of comments on is the lower control arm bushings on the passenger side here. Uh, forward lower bushing, yeah, it's completely shot. And actually, if you look at her wheel, see how far back it's pushed? You got two fingers and four fingers. I don't know if that's all the bushing, but the uh, thing is, on these Hondas, when the bushings wear, the, the control arm just gets kind of pulled back a little bit, and if it's not causing edge wear and, and problems, then you kind of just leave them, because it's not like the control arm can come out or cause you any issues. Now, if you're getting a shimmy on the highway, shaking, that's another story. But say something like a BMW, they have the, the lower control arm big bushing on the back, and if, when those get shot, every time you hit the brakes, it's thumping. Now, the way to check these, on the BMW, you push it backwards. You can see this one's not going anywhere when I push it backward. But if you push it forward, see how you get all that movement? That right there is quite a bit. Now, normally, I would say spend the extra money and get yourself OEM bushings. However, if you go on Amazon, it's only 70 bucks for a pair of lower control arms with bushings installed. Quite unbelievable. Uh, and the fact is that side might be bent over there. So tweaked with how far it's pushed back. Oh, I think putting the, the entire arms is the way to go. See over on the driver's side, and a little bit of play there too, but not as bad. On the driver's side a closer look here's the culprit again just replace that bushing if this is your car because this you're better off keeping the better metal on these factory control arms unless you think one might be bent but you probably get an oem bushing for maybe 30 40 bucks i'd imagine and an aftermarket one like 10 bucks on online but uh, here's a look at the new arm and you can see that rubber should be joined all the way across and on this one, it's just completely torn. Now, the only reason it's hitting the subframe is because the suspension's relaxed right now. So normally it, it would just be floating in the middle, driving down the road, it ain't going anywhere, as you can see. And the problem we're gonna have taking this off is sometimes rust gets in between the sleeve and that bolt, and it can be a real pain in the butt. So that's the hardest part of the job if that happens, or the second hardest part of replacing the whole control arm is usually the sway bar links. They get rust on these threads. You can see I already sprayed this all down with PB Blast. Uh, those can be a bear to get off and not destroy the sway bar links. So you're almost better off getting links with it, along with ball joints. If you check those and they have play, replace them. These ones, you can see the boots have little cracks, but there's no play. And I'd rather keep the OEM ball joints for now. Over on the passenger side, you can see it's, the bushing's actually not really much worse over here. It's the same deal. However, this is really pushed back. I mean, I can, I can see it just looking at it. So hopefully it's just the lower control arm and not the subframe tweaked or anything like that. I don't see any evidence of a hit. I also don't see any cracked paint or uh, evidence of a bent arm, but that sometimes that can be very hard to tell looking at it. A little trick I like to do on these sway bar links is just cut the rusted threads off if they're completely shot uh, because the only other way of getting it off is, is heating it. Um, you'll never get the nut past those rusted threads without some heat. So we've cut them. We can clamp that lightly. And there we go. We didn't have to deal with the damaged threads. We didn't tear the boot. That's an OEM part that's still usable. Great, because you guys know the aftermarket sway bar links are junk. Maybe there's some good brands, but most of the ones I've used, junk. And there's plastic, there's a plastic sleeve in here, so if you heat this up at all, it just destroys that. And then we've got on the lower ball joint, the best cotter slash hairpin hybrid that's ever been created by Honda, I think made it. You know, it's 160,000 miles. It's never been removed to the best of my knowledge. This car has rust, but look at that, that stainless pin just pops right out. It's got the little genius hook that it hooks on the castle nut. Look at it, look at that action. It's just the best. Unlike a standard cotter pin, you know, you gotta drill them out or hammer them out or just leave them and 
thread the nut off and destroy the threads. I know guys, very exciting stuff. Like what has happened to this channel? <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> that, the bolt came out, wasn't rusted to the sleeve. You guys, if you work on cars, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Unbelievable. This is why you just do the whole arms, because now if we had to go push it, that bush, bushing out with the press, that would take another 10 minutes, you know, and who's got time for that? But if, if you see what I'm saying, like, this is not going anywhere. It's still in its place. It's torn, but it's not gonna harm anything. So the fact that you can fail state inspection here in Pennsylvania for a torn bushing, I don't like it. I, I don't think you should. There's, there's no problem here. It's fine. Like we would call this bushing more of a luxury thing if you want a good smooth ride. Now on the BMWs where they're like twice the size of this, yeah, when those things are shot and the, and the wheels moving three inches back and forth, that's another story. That's, that can be a safety issue. If you, every time you hit the brakes, it's Thumping real bad, safety issue. This would be a great time to replace your lower ball joint if it has any play, or in this case, a torn boot. But nice clean grease in there. That crack is usually pinched shut like it is right now. And uh, you know, no issues. Keep the OEM part if it's good. I'm still on the original ones on my Tundra. No play in them, over 200K. Been under underwater in the river, good to go. You put some, some aftermarkets in there, I just, I've seen so many problems with them. So if you're going to replace your lower ball joints, get OEM. Here's your side-by-side -side comparison. Looks good. It's incredible that they sell these for $35 each. Less than what a factory bushing costs. And you know, again, it's only that vertical bushing, the horizontal one. No issues at all, that OE's. Uh, it's got a little crack in it, but it's, it's not torn. Of course, getting the new one in is a little harder because the bushing's not torn, so it's not going to just fall out, you know? And get started in there first, and then bend her over. And run her home. And then you can run that rear horizontal bushing bolt down. Just kidding. Loosen it back up and bring this up to ride height. Yes, most of you guys know, but when it comes to the horizontal bushings, always bring it up to ride height, otherwise you're gonna have premature uh, bushing failure. You wanna torque that one down and the sleeve is set up with the suspension at the ride height. You just gotta make sure to take that measurement before you flip the car. And then you can zip her down. While it's jacked, we can zip down the, the ball joint lightly because i always like to hand torque ball joints these get about 50 pounds thereabout i think it's like 40 something to 51 right basically until you can line that keyway up or i'm sorry the, the cotter pin hole keyway it's perfectly lined up right there at 50 foot pounds and then slip your lock pin in whatever these are called hairpins cotter pins i don't know but they're great see since we torqued that at ride height now that it's in the relaxed position, that bushing is under tension, which is fine, but we don't want it to always be riding under tension when the car is normally sitting on the ground. That's the reason for that. A lot of people don't though. They just throw these arms in there and you know, it's, it's fine, but it will lead to that bushing being torn prematurely, especially the aftermarket ones. The rubber just doesn't seem to last like the OEM stuff, you know? It just doesn't. Here's a side-by-side -side on the arm from the passenger that we thought was bent, but it doesn't seem to be looking at it over top. I was measuring it too. They both check out to be identical. Although they are not completely identical because uh, this one has some extra metal on the inside. I can see through that hole. This, this guy's hollow and you see how that's like pretty skinny where it mounts to the edge. And this one's a little girthier and different sound too just be that super thick paint but anyway they each have the forged steel welded on where the ball joint goes and that'll be fine so the ball joint on this side actually has quite a bit of play look at that 
Now that whole spiel I was saying about uh, not using the aftermarket ball joints. Well, I'm gonna go against that because this kit actually came with lower ball joints that I didn't want to use, but uh, if, that's, if it's got play, we'll give it a go. I do like that it has the grease irk. Well, we'll do one and again, the other side, zero play, fine for now. We'll address it in the future. You don't have to take the arm off to do it anyway. You could just take this nut off on the outside, swing it out, press it, no big deal. Now, yes, you could probably drive around with that for several more years, but I've seen quite a few Hondas get their wheel tucked under. It seems to always happen slow speed in like a parking lot. I've never seen it happen on the highway. Air hammer, best tool ever. It's funny, a guy I used to work with, Joe was his name, they, they took his air hammer away from him because he was breaking so much stuff. He just used it for everything. And uh, it can get the job done, but it can also cause a lot of damage. Like if you, you could break a knuckle easily or damage it. You gotta be careful. Nothing like a good ball joint press. This is the OTC and kind of a funny story. When I bought this, I've had this for many years, but uh, the one I had prior was like a, maybe Harbor Freight or wherever I got it. it, it bent on me. It was an overseas one and the first time I used it, it just, it just opened up. I was like, man, oh, returned it actually. And then I went to Retool was the name of the store. I was hoping to get like a nice quality used one or whatever. And they had a brand new OTC, forget the price, it was reasonable. Uh, made in USA. I was like, yeah, I'll take it. And so he says, oh, I got one brand new in box in the back. You can take that. I'm like, all right, cool. Because this was the, the showroom floor one. And so he brings it out. I open it and it said made in China on there. I was like, you know what? If you don't care, I'll grab the showroom one and you can put that one out. And he was, he was a little reluctant, but he understood. I mean, it's like, I guess I get the last OTC C-frame that was made in USA. I don't know. And then these are all just adapters I added. I, I cut the, cut it out so I could add those. Great kit. So we got one fresh ball joint. Drop the grease circ in. And it should have an angled one, actually. How the heck are you going to grease that? And go in my grease kit, get an angled one. Because the axle's sitting right there, you know? Unless you have the angled head. And uh, these aftermarket ones come with a retaining ring too. Probably just in case the bore is worn out inside the knuckle or something. You know, you have, I don't want to have ones popping out. These ring pliers are too small though. There we go. That is more like it. Take a look at that new bushing. That'll tear in about a year, maybe less. And that final step is to torque the axle. Always a good idea to not whack them down with a gun. Use a torque wrench because otherwise you can damage the bearings. Look at that. Much, much better. Still not perfect. We got three fingers and three and a half on the front, but that is uh I fixed it. So it should drive a little bit better too now, but we need to check the alignment. Going down the road, it is driving straight as can be. I'm guessing it's had an alignment before with the bushing being torn and worn out. So let's just check it, see what it's at. And there's what we're looking like. A little bit of toe out on the right rear, but both fronts, huge toe out, negative 0.6. 
and our camber caster's out too, but uh, tight time schedule right now, so I'm gonna leave the camber caster alone. They're not adjustable anyway. On the camber, we could put a smaller bolt on the one of the uh, strut bolts, lower or upper. Luckily, I hosed everything down before. On our rear toe, you loosen this nut and then turn the big guy. And I'm getting lucky. Nothing's seized up so far. I don't have a monitor, so that should be good enough. Let's see. Oh yeah, 0.06, I'm good with it. Normally you can bring this back, but for some reason it doesn't seem to be working. And you see adjust in the rear actually changed the front toe specs as well. Now we're negative 0.49. Negative 0.78. And on these Hondas, the tie rod end is all the way up top. So luckily we had sprayed that and I made sure it moved. It's 24 millimeter and 14, or you can get a 19 on there too, but a little harder to get to it than the ones down here, you know. Yeah, got that right in the center of spec on the toe. I'll call that good enough for now. And after the alignment, driving nice and straight. It's a good example of why even if your car drives straight, you should still check the alignment because that toe out would have caused a lot of edge wear on those tires over time. No, I mean, it's, it's like we're driving outside. There's no insulation, there's nothing. Yeah, she looks good parked on the main street, even if it's winter time. Stopping in my buddy's place, uh, the Yardley General and the Yardley Cellar too. It's actually uh, childhood friends in this cool little bar, so great spot if you're ever in town. See what you think of us. This is Scooby Doo right here. Yeah, man. It's got your name all over it. <laughs> oh, do we got a brake light out? Did you tell him about reverse? He shouldn't have to go in reverse. He's going to just park it there. <laughs> Look how good she looks over there. Oh, yeah. Right Not as good looking as you, though. Not as good looking as you. Put the camera down. No filming in the casino. All right, Jen has a certain pose from a certain show she's gonna do. Let's see if you guys can guess what it is. Let's see. It was, uh, oh, you had some good lighting there. You got it. Love it. That's <laughs> perfect. All right, let's get out of here before they kick us out. You got some some spectators. Let's get out of here. Oh, that stubborn right. door. She got it. And that should wrap this one up. We did a little bit of everything. Uh, I want to say. Big thank you to Scott over at Holly for hooking it up with the Sniper 2. A massive thank you to you guys for tuning in, especially if you watched this far. Channel just rolled over to 500,000 subscribers, which is mind blowing. I mean, I know that the second channel has 520K or thereabout, but that was mostly from like some, some tire short videos that went, you know, 80 million views or whatever it was. 
So main channel 500K, I thank you guys very, very much and hope to see you in many adventures 2024. I know, uh, you know, it's not always a crazy adventure. Sometimes just bringing you along, but I try to keep the long format stuff on this channel and the random shorter stuff on second and then the even more random on the miscellaneous channel. So again, just I ramble a lot, I talk a lot, and I know there was a lot of talking in this video more than likely, so that'll be fun to edit. Uh, a lot of outtakes of me stuttering my words. Thank you everybody who's jumped on nonsensenohow.com and picked something up. The 2023 Christmas ornaments sold out, so thank you guys very much for that support. Can't think of too much else to mention. Oh, I'm gonna go ahead, change out that Fury coolant one last time. System's nice and clean, and go put my triple pulley on the carport tarp that just came in the mail. That'll be nice. Oh, so, thanks very much. See you guys in another video very soon. No nonsense, no how. Guys, did you get a new toy? Did you get a new toy? Yeah. Trucker Bob sent you that. Well, he's gonna bark. So try to get it. Try to get it.